Hello and welcome to the channel. This is Fuzzy Theory with a video talking about the matrix in European or continental philosophy. The reason I want to do this video is because not many people have talked about this subject matter, uh, both in scholarship but also just on YouTube or in popular culture, um, at least in detail. So for example, the Philosophy and Matrix book from 2003 didn't really spend any time on the stuff I'm talking about today. And I searched YouTube, I mean, not thoroughly, but to a certain degree, and I didn't really see anybody going in depth on this subject. Another reason why I wanted to do uh, this topic is because I think it's super important for understanding the trilogy. Um, and finally, I think that uh, it's actually, the Matrix is actually a very useful medium through which we can understand European philosophy, especially French theory. And so uh, by looking at the matrix, we can, it can help us understand some of the, some of the differences between French theorists and some of the ways that uh, they're approaching how we understand the world. So the first thing to note, I think, about the matrix is that it has a huge number of references. They reference so much in those movies. They reference religious things, especially Christian and uh, Buddhist uh, elements. Um, they reference all sorts of philosophical engagements, like uh, Plato's allegory of the cave or Socrates's Know Thyself. Um, they reference tons of pop culture, right? For example, with uh, I Know Kung Fu, right? And uh, so on. I do think that French theory is one of the most important ways to understand what is happening in the Matrix, what is happening with the trilogy as a whole. Because many people think that the last two movies were actually bad. Um, but I think when we understand how French theory relates to the Matrix... I think that the trilogy as a whole can be redeemed. Right? And uh, so I think the key to understanding this is the work of Jean Baudrillard. And in fact, in the movie, the Wachowskis reference Jean Baudrillard twice. Um, they reference his book, Simulation and Simulacra, in the scene where Neo pulls out from a book uh, the discs for the White Rabbit crew. That book is a book by Jean Baudrillard called Simulation and Simulacra. Another moment where they reference uh, Baudrillard is when Morpheus is explaining to Neo uh, the dystopic version of the future that they live in, and it zooms down to him saying, Welcome to the desert of the real. Um, those are, that's a direct quote from uh, Jean Baudrillard in relationship to his understanding of the hyper-real, which, as we'll see, is a stand-in for the Matrix. Uh, or the Matrix is a stand-in for it. Um, the final thing to note is that they actually made the cast read Jean Baudrillard's Simulation Simulacra. So here uh, we can see an interview with uh, Keanu Reeves where he explains that they made him read Jean Baudrillard, right? Larry and Andrew said, okay, We'd like you to play Thomas Anderson, Neo. I'd read Baudrillard. The reference to Jean Baudrillard gives us our entree into Europe, European philosophy as a way of analyzing the Matrix. And so, in fact, I'm going to go further and I want to say that I'm going to propose that the Matrix trilogy itself is actually a dialogue with French theory. Right? To best understand the Matrix, we have to understand it as saying something in relationship to European philosophy. It's making an argument in relationship to that. So what I'm going to do in this video is both explain the references within the series uh, in relation to continental philosophy, but I'm also going to unveil or explain what their point is, what the Wachowski's point is in relationship to European philosophy. Although I'm focusing on French theory, I want to talk about two German thinkers that influence all French theory. Okay, so the first thinker is Hegel, and almost all French theory uh, is post-Hegelian, so it's in reference to Hegel. Now, Hegel is a super important figure in philosophy because 
he built the last system, the last large uh, enlightenment system of philosophy that tries to encompass all knowledge. Uh, but within that, he says some very interesting things that uh, we still are building off of. Okay, now, the first thing that Hegel talks about, here we're taking our analysis from Kozhev, who is an important um, early 20th century interpreter of uh, Hegel. Most French theory is, is dependent on Kozhev's reading of Hegel. But nonetheless, uh, so the first thing is a master-slave dialectic. This is Hegelian language. And the master-slave dialectic says that there is a struggle to the death. On the meeting of two people, they want the other to recognize themselves as a self. Okay? Normally we think of the other as another, but real recognition is, is I'm not another, I'm a self. So the master-slave dialectic says that we have a confrontation to death. We have two choices for the loser. The loser either dies, which is a form of uh, winning for Hegel, or they accept to become the slave to the winner, the master, right? And this sets up a binary, the master-slave dialectic. Now, what Hegel says is that eventually the slave becomes uh, the dominant person in that binary, because the master ends up being dependent on the slave. The slave is the one who gets authenticity through their labor. The slave actually ends up having sort of the power. So it becomes a power dynamic that is relational as opposed to power going from the master to the slave. We actually see that the slave has a huge amount of power within that relationship just because the master ends up depending on the slave. We're going to see this play out all through the matrix, this master-slave dialectic, okay? And we're going to move, we're going to see how it's in the matrix, but we're also going to see how the matrix moves past it, along with French theory. Failure to comply with this process will result in a cataclysmic system crash, killing everyone connected to the matrix, which coupled with the extermination of Zion will ultimately result in the extinction of the entire human race. You won't let it happen, you can't. You need human beings to survive. There are levels of survival we are prepared to accept. Okay. Now, the other Hegelian element we want to bring together is he the Hegelian movement of history, which is that for Hegel, he posits that the movement of history, uh, like literally, is through the oppositional confrontation of ideologies. So what happens is somebody puts forth... Um, a thesis. Now, that can be a material thesis, like, hey, we're a country, we're going to do this thing. Or it can be an ideological thesis. Okay, liberal democracy, that's what we're doing, right? Then what happens is, historically, um, an antithesis comes to that, right? So that we have uh, the thesis is, hey, here's what I'm doing. The antithesis says, no, don't do that. And then there's a struggle. So Hegel is all, all about these binary struggles. And through that struggle, we get a synthesis, okay? So the thesis and the antithesis come together to create a th synthesis, right? And the synthesis is the historical joining of these two things, and they, they meld somehow, and we get a synthesis. Now, what happens is that synthesis becomes a thesis, and an antithesis develops towards that synthesis, right? And so that thesis, that new thesis and its antithesis come together and smash and confrontation and creates a new synthesis, right? And for Hegel, this process just repeats and repeats and repeats throughout history. Now, the interesting thing about Hegel is that he's sort of a, a crypto-Catholic um, so that for him, these binaries are moving towards uh, some utopian future, which he calls absolute spirit or absolute geist. Okay? And that absolute spirit is, you know, history becoming one with the, you know, cr the Lord creation, etc., etc. Like, for Hegel, it's not the Lord. He's, he's secularizing Catholicism here. But nonetheless, it is this utopian future, right? So, but we see this Hegelian stuff throughout the Matrix. This binary between machines and humans is sort of this master-slave dialectic, but also 
it fits into this Hegelian binary of thesis antithesis, right? And so we see it again with the architect and the oracle, where the architect is reason and efficiency and proficient, precision, and the oracle is intuition and feeling and choice. And together, these two, the thesis and antithesis, this binary, they make the system work, right? Um, now, the interesting thing about the matrix is that, of course, the matrix is doing French theory, and French theory is post hegelian So French theory is saying, no, Hegel doesn't get it right. He starts with, a, you know, like he says something that we can build off of, um, but he's not quite right. And for example, one of the things that the Matrix is doing is it's pulling from the work of Gilles Deleuze. And Gilles Deleuze's work is heavily focused on what's called the excess, right? The excesses of capitalism, the excesses of our structures, and how they always produce what we might call excrement or excess, right? And that excess actually can become the best way to understand culture today. And the matrix pulls on this because in the discussion between the architect and Neo, we see the architect talking about these systemic anomalies, right? So for Hegel, this is a this is a system of uh, binaries with no excess moving towards a utopia, right? But for Deleuze, he's saying no, the excess actually defines the system. Right, And this makes sense. Neo is actually necessary for the system. And for the architect, Neo is an excess. Everything we don't plan for actually becomes the thing that defines our society. As I was saying, she stumbled upon a solution whereby nearly 99% of all test subjects accepted the program as long as they were given a choice, even if they were only aware of the choice at a near unconscious level. While this answer functioned, it was obviously fundamentally flawed, thus creating the otherwise contradictory systemic anomaly that, if left unchecked, might threaten the system itself. Ergo, those that refuse the program, while a minority, if unchecked, would constitute an escalating probability of disaster. That's sort of all I wanted to say about Hegel, but we can move to the next German thinker, who is, uh, we all know, Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche is probably one of the most influential thinkers uh, in all of continental thought. But interestingly, uh, some of the things that the Oracle says are related to things that Nietzsche talks about. And one of those is, is philosophy of the eternal recurrence. He, he posits this interesting thing. It's an existential discussion about what are we going to do with our lives, right? And so he posits a hypothetical situation where you wake up one morning and there's Mephistopheles at the end of your bed and he says, ha ha ha, I'm going to do something evil. I'm going to make you relive your life over and over again where everything is exactly the same. Everything has happened up until now exactly as it did before. And you're just going to have to keep reliving that over and over and over and over and over again. Now for Nietzsche, this thought project is in order to tell us, hey, this is how you live your fullest life. If you can say to Mephistopheles, great, do it, right, then you're living well. But if you're, if to Mephistopheles you say, oh no, don't ever do that, that's torture, right, then Nietzsche's saying, hey, you're not living authentic authentically. Now, what's really interesting is, is that uh, this is referenced in the matrix, matrix, the eternal recurrence. The oracle mentions it. Now, since the real test for any choice is having to make the same choice again, knowing full well what it might cost, I guess I feel pretty good about the choice, because here I am at it again. Another element of Nietzsche that the oracle mentions uh, is when she says things to Neo, like, hey, you've already decided, now you got to figure out why you decided. That's very Nietzsche. And that, Nietzsche talks about that in a couple books, where he says, we act first, and then we interpret our actions afterwards. It's a very interesting analysis. And for Nietzsche, you know, there's, there's a whole number of things going on there, but, I mean, some of them are cultural, some of them are psychological, and some of them existential, right? Now, of course, Nietzsche is most famous for his reevaluation of all values. In his book, Genealogy of Morals, and in, good, in Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche talks about how all of those things we take to be absolute truths 
are in fact just stuff we've created historically and we can and should try and reevaluate those values because that's authentic living if you're just accepting what your culture and what history tells you then in, in to use a sartrean term that's bad faith you're not actually believing the thing you're just accepting something without interrogating it. And so, but one of the things that comes out of this reevaluation of all values is that it provokes kind of a, a, a vitalism, right? And we're going to sort of come back to this as it relates to Sartre, but the notion that we can reevaluate all values means that we can construct our own values. And for Nietzsche, and this Nietzsche is a bit more about this than the French theorists, but for Nietzsche, he wants us to live. He wants us to like one of the reasons he promotes a kind of aristocratic values, as he calls it, he says, stop kowtowing to your culture, your system. You live for yourself. You be your own ubermensch. You decide for yourself what your values are. You live. Basically, his point is, be bold in the face of those who want you to conform. Okay? And uh, that's his, ex that's, that's for, for Nietzsche, that's authenticity. And that's really interesting because uh, it really informs a lot of what's happening both with French theory and the Matrix. We see this with some of the ways that, um, for example, Trinity acts uh, or Neo acts, right? Especially at the end. Now, of course, really that's a Sartrean, like a Jean-Paul Sartre's uh, engagement, but he's pulling it from Nietzsche here. He's really pulling that vitalism from Nietzsche.